Welcome to this podcast series about networking. My name is Bruce Hartpence, a faculty member at RIT, and I will be your host. To find out more, you can visit us at www.nssa.rit.edu. Thanks for listening. This first podcast will be a short introduction to the series, as the podcasts are companions to a pair of books written for networking students and professionals. Since the books, the Packet Guide to Core Network Protocols and the Packet Guide to Routing and Switching, contain a lot of information, we'll ease into things. After all, the networking world can be a dangerous place. If you are new to networking and find things a little confusing, don't panic. Later podcasts will provide a lot more background and fill in the details. If you already understand a bunch of this stuff, don't fall asleep, just move on to the next one in the series. Building a network can be quite simple, but as we'll see, things can get complicated fast. So, we'll start with the basics. Some of the components that might be considered the building blocks of a network are equipment, such as routers and switches, cables or the cabling, computers, and a connection to the outside world. Usually this is via an Internet Service Provider or ISP. Let's take a look at the equipment first. A list of the gear standard to most networks would include routers, switches, and access points. These vary in size and vendor, but the basic functions are largely consistent. The last device on our list is a home gateway. Though small and inexpensive, it actually has the capabilities of the other devices on the list but is not robust enough for commercial networks. But they are terrific in what we call small office home office or SOHO settings. Before we go any further, we should go over a couple of key ideas. Protocols and addresses are part of the inner workings of a network. They work behind the scenes or under the hood. A protocol provides the rules for communication. For example, in a conversation, we obey rules for language and tempo in order to be understood. The same is true for networks. The main protocols of any network include TCP, UDP, IP, and Ethernet. In addition to these rules, each one of these has a particular type of address to get the job done. Another important idea is layering. Each one of the protocols has a different job to do. Over the course of a particular transmission, for example, viewing a website, protocols assert themselves at different times. This is because they operate at different layers of our networking architecture. Now, architecture and models are a little beyond what we want to do in this podcast. But now you have the lingo. Network devices also have their own job to do, and so are designed to function at a particular layer. Taking this one step further, Devices process transmissions based on the addresses and protocols at that layer. For example, a computer sends network traffic to a switch, which processes the transmission up to a certain point. When it is done, the transmission is forwarded to the router. When the router completes its tasks, it forwards the transmission to the next hop, and so on, and so on. An Ethernet switch is the workhorse of most networks because it is the point that all users, wired or wireless, join the network. I've included wireless users because access points actually connect back to these switches. The main function of a switch is to forward Ethernet frames to the proper destination by examining the Layer 2 MAC address. This is usually the address of a particular computer or another network device such as a printer or router. Now Ethernet frames might be addressed to a single computer but special broadcast frames can be used as well. Switches will forward, or flood, these frames everywhere in order to reach all network nodes. Switches have many other capabilities that make them essential to any network, including network management, gathering statistics, monitoring traffic, and perhaps most significantly, VLANs. Access points are sort of the wireless version of a switch. Users connect to the network via the access point, and wireless 802.11 frames are forwarded based on MAC address, just like the Ethernet frames. Commercial access points have many of the capabilities normally associated with a switch. For example, those VLANs can be extended to the wireless network. 
One of the biggest differences between the two devices is the nature of the network itself. Wireless is considered a broadcast media, which means that anyone can listen in on the transmission. This is why so much work has gone into encrypting wireless networks with WEP, WPA, or 802.11i. Wireless networks are organized around the idea of a cell. An access point has the responsibility of controlling traffic within the cell. This means that there are strict rules regarding 802.11 transmissions and the access point has to issue a special frame called a beacon. This beacon contains the communication parameters for the cell. Moving up to layer 3, we have the router. The router's job is to forward IP packets to the correct network. Ethernet frames do not live beyond their own network, and so we have to use the IP addresses contained within the IP packet for this purpose. Routers forward the packets to one another until they finally reach their proper destinations. Routers still pay attention to layer 2 because they have Ethernet interfaces and MAC addresses just like any other node. But router decisions are made at layer 3. Routers can also perform many other functions in addition to forwarding packets. For example, routers can have firewall rules or access control lists in order to filter traffic. They can handle quality of service and even act as DHCP or TFTP servers. Another common task for a router is network address translation or NAT. Any decent conversation about network devices has to include the multilayer switch. Traditionally, the ideas of routing and switching have been separated in not only the minds of the network engineers, but also in the devices deployed on the network. It was possible to point to a device and, knowing that it was a router or switch, understand the decisions and responsibilities for that particular box. Today, most vendors collapse these responsibilities into a single chassis. It is not uncommon to see a chassis configured with VLANs and routing protocols, while at the same time offering connectivity to end users. This makes identification a little more challenging, because without looking at the model number, you don't know exactly what you're dealing with. But multilayer switch capability does not stop there. Because it has the brains of both, a multilayer switch understands more about the network topology and can make faster forwarding decisions. So, this single box will get traffic to the destination before the router and switch can when working separately. Arguably, the most familiar piece of network equipment to most people is the home gateway. For the price, they're pretty remarkable little devices, having many features built in. A typical model will have switch ports, handle routing of IP packets to the outside world, perform network address translation, basic firewalling for security, and act as a DHCP server handing out IP addresses to all the computers on the home network. Add wireless capability and you have a wireless home gateway. Another cool thing about home gateways is that almost anyone can set one up. Follow the instructions and you are in on the internet party. This is called out of the box usability. But this very selling point introduces a couple of problems or business opportunities depending on how you look at it. Can the average user troubleshoot problems with their home network? Do they understand security? What are the best settings to get the most out of the network? This is where the complexity and key ideas mentioned earlier come in. Networks have a tremendous number of actions that must succeed before we can say that the network and the nodes are safe or that the network is operating at peak efficiency. Now that we have the devices, they have to be interconnected via network cables. Commonly, it is said that network devices are connected via the Ethernet cables, but this is not quite accurate. While it is true that most networks are based on Ethernet, a few details have been left out. Cables can be described in a number of ways. Cable quality is typically based on its category. The higher the number, the better the cable and the greater amount of data that it can carry. So, CAT6 cable is better than CAT5e, which is better than CAT5, which is better than CAT3. Another description is whether the cable is a straight through or a crossover. This is determined by the pinouts or where the individual conductors go. 
the standards that specify these connections are EIA 568A and EIA 568B. Data cables use 568B, and a straight-through cable will be terminated on both ends using this standard. If one side is 568B and the other is 568A, you have a crossover. Patch cables are the ones we can see. In other words, these are not the cables permanently installed in the walls. RJ45 is the jack type. We have both male and female types, and these are what we use in data networks. Like the cables, RJ45 jacks have eight connections. So, to be precise, a patch cable might be described as CAT5E, terminated with RJ45s, according to the 568B standard, for use on an Ethernet network. Okay, we have the network gear, the computers, and the cabling. Once it's all connected together, it might look something like the topology shown here. As you can see, connections from the computers run through the switch to the router, and then usually to the outside world. Most of the time, there's a firewall of some sort for protection against the bad guys. A firewall is a cool name for a network device that examines traffic coming in and out of a network. But it looks a lot like a router or a switch. It might even be built into one of them. If you have a home network, your configuration will be a little different as it will be centered around your home gateway. As noted earlier, the home gateway contains a lot of the functionality of the other devices it's just not as robust, so it has limits regarding the amount of traffic it can handle, and it lacks many of the commercial features seen in the other much more expensive devices. As we've said, a home network is nice because so many of the operations are handled automatically. The user doesn't actually have to do very much at all. But hidden is a vast collection of protocols, tables, and interactions that must occur before the end user can do anything like email, gaming, or web browsing. Some of these protocols include ICMP and ARP, but there are many others. Much of the information used to make networking decisions is also stored in tables, such as source address, routing, and again, ARP. So, for a network professional, knowledge of these protocols, tables, and their operation is a must. As networks grow in size, they often grow in complexity as well. So, in addition to these ideas and protocols, there is a collection of other concepts that are very important to a good networker. Two of these are VLANs and subnetting, which includes supernetting and CIDR. But good network design is also about understanding what the network is going to be used for. Thus, keeping tabs on end-user applications and how they work can be very important. Good examples of applications that have had a significant impact on network design are voice over IP and video. This brings us to the purpose of the podcast series. We will progress through most of the concepts and components that are part of every single network. As we go, each one will be explained in terms of its structure and operation. I won't be sticking stuff in there that doesn't belong on every network. As I am focused on how networks actually operate, all the topologies seen in the book or discussed in the podcasts were built by me, and together we'll take a look under the hood of each one. Each chapter is supported by lots of packet captures, and this is where the book names come from. Thanks for listening to this networking podcast. I hope that you found it helpful. I also hope to see you at the next one in the series. If you have comments or questions, you can email me at bruce.hartpence at rit.edu or visit www.nssa.rit.edu. Thanks again, and may your packets always reach their destinations.